This changes everything. I'm your host, Steve Ann Meter, and thanks for joining me today. And we just got a shocking new report that shows the Bureau of Labor Statistics is overstating the payroll report, not just by a little bit, by a significantly large amount. Now, I know regular viewers of the show, you're not surprised by this at all. We've talked about how the BLS on a routine basis makes up jobs, and then years later, when it does its annual revision, sometimes going back as much as a year and a half or more, then goes back and restates and says, oh, by the way, we were off. Sometimes, well, by a lot. But the reason this is so significant and something that we've talked about on the show is that how faked data leads to other departments making decisions. In this case, one of the most important decisions being made by the Federal Reserve in terms of setting monetary policy, who does so and uses the non-farm payroll report as one of its guides. And now we're finding out that the Bureau of Labor Statistics has massively overstated the payroll gains, putting the Fed in a position where it's aggressively tightened monetary policy based on these false numbers and now setting the economy up for a place where it's only likely to come crashing down hard. And if you've ever wondered why the Fed gets it always gets this wrong every time, well, when you use fake data, there's no surprise. Let's head over to the Philly Fed where we pick today's story up. And here we see this report released just the other day, early benchmark revisions of state payroll employment. Now, this is kind of seems unusual because you might be asking is, well, wait a minute, what does the Philly Fed have to do with payroll reports? Well, you'd be surprised. They do an actually pretty good job. Estimates by the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia indicate that the employment changes from March through June of 2022 were significantly, again, keyword significantly different in 33 states and the District of Columbia compared with the current state estimates from the Bureau of Labor Statistics current employment statistics data. Early benchmark indicates Estimates indicated higher changes in four states, lower changes in 29 states in the District of Columbia, and lesser changes in the remaining 17 states. So what are we hearing initially from this report is, hey, they grossly overestimated their payrolls. And again, that led to the Fed to aggressively tightening policy. And again, you can just see this setup and why the Fed gets it wrong every time and why this data that we're looking at right now just changes everything. Our estimates incorporate more comprehensive, I mean, get this, more comprehensive, accurate job estimates released by the BLS as part of its quarterly census of employment and wages program to augment the sample data from the BLS's CES that are issued monthly on a timely basis. All percentage change calculations are expressed as an annualized rate, and we can dig deeper now, but here's the staggering number. This is what I want you to see. In aggregate, 10,500 net new jobs were added during the period, let's just go back and look, between March and June, rather than the 1.121 million jobs estimated by the sum of states. And again, this is an overestimation by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, not a little bit, but over a million jobs according to the Philly Fed. Now, again, you put yourself in the position of a board member of the FOMC or in head, the head of it as Jerome Powell, and you're making policy decisions based on a number that's off by a million payrolls, potentially. And the question we'll be asking after this is, well, what about the data after that? If this is wrong, how wrong is that as well? Here you can see the the CES estimated net growth of 1.047 million jobs for the period, but payroll jobs in the nation remained essentially flat from March through June, according to the Philly Fed, which means after adjusting for the quarterly data from the BLS, less than 3% growth indicated by the sum of the states, less than the 2.8% growth indicated by the US CS estimates, again, coming in well under what we've been looking at, what we've been told. Now, you kind of wonder why the BLS will later on revise things, because they do it at a point where it really doesn't matter. In an upward trending market where the, uh, the stocks are rising, the economy is growing, if they come back and say, hey, we were off you know, a million jobs a year or so ago, 
the, the market doesn't care. Now, right now, if they came out and said, oh, by the way, we were off this year, I mean, the market would have a massive reaction to it. And again, this is why they delay it. Not only is it hard for them to calculate, but they're not very good at it. Over the cumulative three-quarter period, ending with this 2022 quarter two vintage, which excludes additional QCEW data changes affecting the prior two quarters, payroll jobs in the nation grew 3.5%. Again, this is now less than 4.1% than the growth based on the sum of the states. This is less than the 4.2% growth based on the U.S. CES estimates. And current U.S. CES estimates indicate job growth was 4% over a 12-month period period through September 2021 and 2.8% over the four months since June of 2022. Again, pointing all this data to showing us that the Fed is making policy decisions on grossly inaccurate data. And this shouldn't be a surprise because we've talked about this on this show. I've gone over and talked about this on my friend Jeff Snyder's show, which you can find at Euro Dollar University on YouTube. We talk about things like this every weekend. And what have we noted? There's a big discrepancy between the two reports the Bureau of Labor Statistics does. They do the headline non-farm pay report and the household survey. This chart from Zero Hedge really sums it up. And here you can see the divergence between the household and the establishment survey, the data showing 2.7 million, suggesting that the Philly Fed is right on track with the BLS fabricating jobs. And now we know that between March and June, monthly payrolls were overstated by a whopping 350,000. This matters because what the BLS reported for payrolls in those months were nice numbers, averaging probably around 350,000. Now, when we take those numbers and adjust them to subtract the average of 350,000 from each month to get to the revised Philly Fed payroll over this period, you get payrolls of 18,000, 36,000, 57,000 now from April through June. And you can only ask yourself, would the Fed, given going back and having data as that, be setting themselves up to do those consecutive 75 basis point hikes? And the answer is no way, no how, not a chance and put this in graphical terms, this is what the payrolls would have looked like. And as you can see here, it's just downright ugly. And now we see how that translates into the economy as we head over to the Wall Street Journal this week. Well, we already covered retail sales, but we didn't talk about manufacturing declines point to a slowing economy. And again, you start to ask yourself, will the tighter monetary policy eventually filter through and lead to a crash in the manufacturing sector? And the answer is yes, it will. We've even got some preliminary data we'll look at here in a moment, but let's get into this headline data first that shows a drop in November manufacturing output included declines in consumer goods and business equipment products, contributing to a 0.2% drop in overall industrial production, according to the Fed. Industrial production also measures utilities and mining output. Now you might say that's not really a big deal, Steve, 0.2%, but when you put it in context of the market, now in this chart we have industrial production in blue against the Wilshire 5000 or total US stock market in red, both on a year-over-year rate of change. What we can note, going back to history of the early recorded data we've got, the stock market, as you can see in red, leads industrial production lower. We can see that over and over again. And here we see it happening. And what this would tell us, you know, if the Fed was working with accurate data, or we'll just give them the benefit of the doubt, somewhat accurate data, they wouldn't be aggressively tightening because they would already be able to see from the data we're headed into that soft landing and that they would need to pull back the reins a little bit on their tightening schedule to allow the economy to absorb the rate hikes and see what happens. Instead, what have they done? They put the pedal to the metal. They've driven this thing even harder. And what we can see going into next year is there's going to likely be an acceleration to the downside in industrial production in the manufacturing sector. And in fact, we've already got some data today, some preliminary data that suggests it's already happening. 
Here you can see the US PMI scream recession in December, according to the flash report, which is a preliminary ahead of the actual port here in a couple of weeks. After tumbling to their lowest level since COVID lockdown collapsed, S&P Global's PMI surveys were expected to rebound mostly in preliminary December data this morning. However, the consensus was very wrong as both services and manufacturing saw further and notable deterioration. Here you can see the U.S. manufacturing PMI drop from 47.7. Now remember, below 50 is the contraction to 46.2, so it's contracting at a faster rate. Look at the services sector, which is supposed to lag the manufacturing sector went from contracting at 46.2 to an acceleration it's contracting faster at 44.4 now keep in mind when you see these pmis get under 45 it actually means we're talking recessionary data here so we're seeing the u.s services sector which we weren't supposed to see in a recession is leading the manufacturing sector very unusual and we put this in a chart perspective we can see we're heading back to levels we haven't seen since the pandemic and here we can see on this chart the u.s manufacturing pmis in in blue and the services in red. And we can note that the last time we saw data, of course, just with the services sector was here a couple months ago. But beyond that, we're going back to March of 2020 as we saw a deceleration in both the manufacturing services sector going into the pandemic. And business conditions are worsening as 2022 draws to a close with a steep fall in the PMI indicative of GDP contracting in the fourth quarter and an annualized rate of around 1.5%. Job growth has meanwhile slowed to a crawl as firms across both manufacturing and services take a much more cautious approach to hiring amid the slump in consumer demand. That from, of course, S&P Global. So what we're seeing here is, remember, we had two quarters of contraction. We were told that was in recession. The third quarter rebounded. And now we're already seeing signs that the fourth quarter is likely to end in a contraction. And here we can see this, this chart from the S&P Global's flash US PMI composite output index in blue, leading US GDP on a quarter over quarter change to the downside. And last but not least, I want to take a look at the Philly Fed data, which we also got. Of course, you know we love the Philly Fed data on the show because of its long history that we can use as a guide. And even it's now indicating that things beyond the jobs report aren't that great. And here we see manufacturing activity. This data from December 5th through 12th in the region continued to decline overall in December, according to firms reporting. The survey's broad indicators for current activity were all negative, and the firms on balance reported a decline in employment. That's not going to be a good sign when we get the December payroll report in January. The future indicators improve, suggesting the firms expect overall growth over the next six months to get a bit better. But as we look into the current data, we'll Look at this, new orders contracting at a faster rate, shipments contracting, meaning they're happening fast, shipments are being delivered quicker. You see, our shipments to the factory are happening faster. Unfilled orders contracting at a slightly slower rate, but they're getting filled. Delivery times contracting at a faster rate, meaning delivery companies are getting those goods to the places they need to faster. Prices paid, the inflation component are expanding at a slightly slower rate but get this the average employee work week so even though people are keeping their jobs we're seeing the work week contract of course in the payroll report it won't show a job loss but if the work week is contracting that means hourly employees are getting paid less that will eventually feed back into the economy and so what we can see here is all these made up jobs by the BLS are going to come back to haunt us particularly as the Fed does what it always does and that's over Titan. I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.